Good to meet all of you as well. So, um, yeah, my name is Bradley Nissen. Uh, this is an urban retrofit. Uh, in order to transition towards a more circular construction economy, the reuse of existing buildings and their materials within them is imperative. In this project, I have interrogated the current model of development in order to propose an alternative system with a focus on collecting material data to create a robust network of material reuse. To begin, I will explain the effects of urbanization on material extraction and its consequences. Next, I will interrogate an alternative development model occurring in Liverpool. Next, I will explore policies that could instigate a transition towards a more circular construction economy. And finally, I will envision how these proposals could work together to create a future material network in Liverpool. Urbanization has led to the concentration of populations and GDP, and the demand for new homes, infrastructure, and services require ever more materials to supply the construction industry. Within the UK, expanding urban areas have caused significant land use change, and the average house price within cities has also increased as a result. The increasing demand for construction materials results in externalities at every stage. For example, offshore sand dredging destroys ecosystems and causes coastal erosion. Uh, in this diagram, the pink externalities are those that directly affect the workers responsible for the extraction of these raw, raw materials. The production stage is extremely energy intensive as well and harmful to workers in their local environments. And during construction, workers are exposed to safety hazards, pollution, and longer than average working hours. The construction industry was responsible for 39% of CO2 emissions in 2018, according to the IEA. Diagramming these construction externalities helps us to better understand all of its effects and underscores the importance of reducing raw material usage. For our project, my team and I decided to focus our attention on Liverpool, a city with a unique history that is currently undergoing rapid development. By analyzing the 2019 Liverpool development update, we categorized the different projects into demolish and build, new build, conversion, and retrofit projects. While retrofit and conversion projects are more sustainable and require less materials, most developments in the Liverpool city center are new constructions. The Lexington is a recent high-rise luxury apartment building, part of the massive Liverpool Waters development, and is typical of the many new build developments in downtown Liverpool. Financing for these large developments typically come from overseas investors engaging in property speculation, and land is sold to developers by the local authority very cheaply. Any buildings originally on the site are demolished with their materials going to landfills. New construction materials are sourced from overseas with little to no material from reuse or from local suppliers. Uh, we calculated the embodied emissions of building materials in the Lexington to better understand the role of large new build construction projects on the climate crisis. Built with a concrete structure, most of the Lexington's embodied emissions are associated with the production of cement and rebar and the transportation of sand and aggregates. Um, but we also calculated the emissions if the structure were uh, instead made of steel um, or timber to compare the embodied carbon. While the Lexington is typical of new build projects, there are alternative models of development occurring in the South Liverpool neighborhood of Granby. We met with Hazel Tilly, a local community leader and founder of the Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust, or CLT. She told us about the history of the Granby neighborhood and what the community has accomplished so far, so I'll let her describe that. There were 93 shops, and you didn't have to go anywhere outside the Granby to do shopping. So if you lived in Granby, you could shop in Granby, you could do everything very locally, and you could get good quality stuff. Race and from the 50s really led to be a prize in 1981. Then the area was ghettoed off by the police, so they put bollards on every road, so that there was only one way in and out of the Granby Triangle, and then there was a gradual, just sort of, left the place rot. Then the council decided in their wisdom that they would knock the whole lot down on the housing market in you know, Europe and this bit. And that's when people at Granby got together and decided to do something. Managed decline, a policy of the Thatcher government, let the buildings within Granby fall into disrepair with the intent of driving out the local residents. In the early 2000s, the Housing Market Renewal Initiative, or HMRI, 
identified zones across Liverpool and the UK affected by managed decline to be demolished and rebuilt. Granby residents like Hazel campaigned against the demolition of their neighborhood and won. In 2011, the, neighborhood, or the residents formed the Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust and petitioned the local council to transfer ownership of some of the vacant properties to the CLT. They successfully renovated 11 homes in Granby and converted two into the popular Winter Garden, uh, an indoor community space. During our site visit, we also were able to visit uh, the Winter Garden, excuse me. Uh, during our site visit, we were also able to visit the Winter Garden um, and meet with other community members like James and McGee. Community land trusts like Granby Forest Street keep more wealth within the community when compared to the privatization model. Uh, and they have the potential to dramatically reduce material consumption by in instigating renovations instead of demolitions and by sourcing local and reclaimed materials. The Granby model is a form of public common partnership as described by Commonwealth and the Center for Local Economic Strategies. These, models of these are our models of joint ownership and governance where a council or local authority works with a commons association, such as, such as a community land trust, to enable more radical solutions to local problems. In Granby, the derelict homes slated for demolition were instead handed over to the Granby CLT, allowing for them to be sustainably retrofitted and affordably rented, bypassing property speculation and wasteful development. Ducey Street in Granby is still facing an ongoing development challenge. The homes are the most derelict in the neighborhood, and the current proposal is to demolish and replace them with expensive, newly built homes. If these homes are indeed too damaged to re feasibly repair, they must still be considered valuable stores of materials available for reuse. There are a number of policies that could instigate the recovery of these materials and help facilitate a more circular construction economy. The first step would be to ensure that there is an availability of reclaimed materials for reuse. Mandatory pre-demolition audits would require materials to be cataloged to determine their quantity and reuse potential. Then, local reclamation facilities would be chosen to send the materials to. The material data collected from the audit would then be sent to local reclamation sites, material resellers, and workshops. With common association or common ownership of derelict buildings, community organizations with input from the local council and expertise from relevant companies and organizations can determine a building's suitability for renovation or adaptive reuse. Buildings in the worst condition uh, would be carefully deconstructed to reclaim materials to be used for other projects within the community. Locally reclaimed materials salvaged from deconstructions and retrofits would be sent to a construction library. Here, they are processed and stored for future reuse. Materials would also be traded between material libraries in nearby areas, and local residents can purchase them for their own projects. In collaboration with the Granby Workshop, who helped produce products for the existing Granby renovations, a full-service wood, metal, and ceramic shop would provide the tools necessary to the community for a wide range of DIY and fabrication product projects. The workshop would also function as a tool library to enable the sharing of more expensive equipment. A lack of material data is one of the largest obstacles to reuse. Another initiative, Material Passports, seeks to ensure re recovery and reuse of building components by collecting and distributing material data publicly. Platforms such as BAM, or Buildings as Material Banks, and Medaster are developing material passports that catalog information about building materials to give them value for recovery and reuse. They track material amounts and locations within the building, provide information about their composition, including potentially harmful substances, measure embodied carbon, and track material value over time. Material passport data is valuable for various actors at every stage. For instance, architects can use or can connect material passports to BIM software to choose more sustainable materials with a higher reuse potential. Um, or deconstruction companies can use this information to ensure material reuse at the end of the building's life. By requiring material passports for all new buildings, we could ensure that the information necessary for reuse is available and accessible. 
South Mountain Company architects in the U.S. have been producing owner's manuals for homes they build, providing owners in, with building and material data, equipment manuals and warranty information, and maintenance and operation instructions. Additionally, they provide a booklet full of photographs taken during the construction stage to give the owners information uh, about how the building is constructed. This booklet empowers residents by enabling construction literacy and is extremely helpful for contractors and workers during repairs or renovation projects. Material passports and owner's manuals are important, but they are currently aimed at cataloging information for new buildings. And roughly 80% of the buildings we will have in 2050 have already been built. This makes it imperative that any attempt to catalog materials should include existing buildings. Substantial construction projects, such as energy retrofits and conversions, would provide the best opportunity to collect material data for existing buildings. Material audits performed at this stage would provide detailed information about materials available for reclamation and would expand our knowledge of the existing building stock. Once collected, this information should be publicly available in the form of material passports, but it should also be formatted into a collection of accessible drawings, like an owner's manual, that provide occupants with detailed information about the construction of the buildings they live and work in and the materials within them. These drawings would show individual components, such as exterior and interior walls, with detailed but relevant data about each material, its origin, expected lifetime, and location within the building. As materials are replaced or added over time, these changes would also be cataloged, such as when uh, an energy retrofit adds thermal insulation. These are uh, just a few more example slides of the types of drawings that you can see in a material manual. Uh, the location of services, such as water supply lines, would also be clearly identified to enable more efficient and effective troubleshooting and repairs. Uh, details about individual appliances, including warranty information and repair instructions, would be included as well. Building on the public common partnership model, the collection and distribution of material data would be a collaborative effort between the local authority, deconstruction companies, and local universities studying material science and engineering. Material producers would be required to include their products in publicly available material passports and data from audits of deconstructions and retrofit projects would also be included. This information would then be used by architects and construction companies to create material manuals for each building they work on. In a neighborhood like Granby with many self-similar homes, publicly available material manuals for one home would also be relevant for others living in similar terrace houses. Eleven unique material manuals would be able to provide some relevant information about the construction of 186 houses in Granby. Material manuals would promote construction literacy and empower local residents by giving them access to detailed but accessible information about their homes. This information would be available publicly within the construction library along with access to more detailed material passport databases. With detailed information available for reclaimed materials, architects and contractors uh, can better compare new and reclaimed materials to make a more sustainable choice. Additionally, the history of reclaimed materials can imbue them with a cultural value and help people develop a more personal connection with them. Public common partnerships could also play a role in establishing local building regulations. Community organizations, architects, and construction companies could work together to provide guidelines that would best enable material reuse and innovation within construction while prioritizing the living standards of the community. A supply of reclaimed materials, workshop, and publicly available material data in the construction library would provide the skills, knowledge, tools, and materials necessary for a circular construction economy. New construction projects would become acts of local participation as residents and CLT members would have a voice in how their community changes. Organizations like the Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust will be central to a new material network. Other community land trusts throughout Liverpool affected by the HMRI can build upon the successes of Granby. Additionally, existing and new material resellers and local workshops would have access to a supply of reclaimed materials and data to be reintroduced into the urban fabric. 
These changes must be instigated and supplemented by local policies such as requiring pre-demolition audits and material passports and by creating incentives to collect material data on existing buildings during renovations or conversions. Together, these policies and proposals enable us to envision how a neighborhood like Granby could continue to grow and thrive within a more circular construction economy. Thank you. material and so forth and to reuse what can be used, etc. You mentioned the community land trust. That for me is an absolute key mm -hmm. because if you do not have the ownership in this feudal country, because that's what it still is, then you cannot act actually and they had managed to get that. So I think in, when you say your material catalogue and all that sort of stuff and make it publicly available, this is very important but in parallel I think you should also then push that bit about ownership, about uh, access rights and all mm -hmm. these kind of things and of course when you when you rebuild or regenerate uh, you, you then also can say well there is the old and then there is what desirable for example better insulated buildings etc maybe densification which I see that you're doing there and so on and then I think what would be also useful is to take maybe a little bit bigger picture the whole neighborhood because you have you know that that's 19th century uh, that's how people lived then. Now, uh, you have different needs. Uh, I mean, you need the fiber optic, you need all sorts of stuff like that. So to look at what sort of networking infrastructure you can also foresee when you do all these changes, including s local services. I mean, you know, the famous 10-minute city and so forth, which I don't really think is the solution, like n no monolithic monorail uh, design solution is a solution, but it is part of it. And so I think also, for example, well, where you try to get people less cars, for example, to have more public, flexible public uh, transport, so you have more space for other things, for, for open, open areas, for, well, for growing food, whatever, you know. And I think it's this kind of in integrated land use uh, s strategy, when you do the re regeneration step by step, of course, would be a very useful addition to, to what you're doing. Uh, another thing about about uh, the speculation and not not I mean of course uh, when you said you will, you have more pressure you want more buildings and so on I mean that, there is a study which I forget now who did it but that in fact showed that in the UK it's not that we lack housing we have more housing than households we lack the access to it and so on we have we have the so-called luxury flats in tower blocks where I live in Westminster empty, you know, and so on. Pure speculation. I mean, it's commodities, it's no longer use value. And I think that is another aspect, the political aspect, which you brought Kat Thatcher in, but also right to buy, which they can't do in the land trust. That's one of the advantages. So it will c stay together. So I think that's why this aspect is a very important parallel to what you are doing. Then on the materials, uh, of course, there were some materials which, were, which are good, like brick and stuff like that. But what about lead? What about asbestos? What about, you know, uh, plastic? So I think, you know, to think how do you replace those things for new, for the uses of the 21st century. So that, again, when you have your catalog of new materials to show what are the most sustainable ones to add to. Right? Yeah, I can, I can go. Um, Gosh, I've, I've, thank you. Lo lots to work with there, and I think um, demonstrated by how many comments there are to, to, to make on this as well. Um, the, the 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 question at the at the core is is one that Graham Brooker at the RCA really takes issue with this idea of retrofit. Um, he he says don't use that word because it talks about putting something into the past, fitting something into the past. And actually, what you're doing is very future orientated. Um, so, uh, you know, again, what Brooker would say is adaptive reuse is the term because that talks about an active process of adaptation and reusing. So what I would do is, is I would encourage a, a flip of the words there to something that that's, that's more accurately describes the process that's, that's taking place. 
Um, and of course that question about what's discarded, because there still have to be materials that are discarded. What is the manner in which they're discarded? Are there ways in which these materials can be remade or disposed of safely as, as part of that process? So the question of disposal is still one that, 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 that features there. Um, I loved that there was a moment where you spoke about the, the embodied labor in the materials. And there was a good article, a short article on failed architecture a couple of years ago called The, the Missing Bodies in Architecture's Talk of Embodied Energy, which, which, uh, which really brings up the question of labor. And labor as part of these material and financial flows is something that contemporary neoliberal economics attempts to suppress. It, it, it wants to de-skill a workforce because a skilled workforce is also an empowered workforce with a collective voice. So the sorts of workers who are engaged with adaptive reuse are the sorts of workers that have indispensable skills and thus have a voice. Uh, so there's a real political core to, to the question here. And I think this is one of the reasons why the industry militates against adaptive reuse. Um, because that question of an empowered labor force is a really frightening one for flows of capital that seek to be disembodied and disemplaced, which is really the way that, 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 that contemporary uh, speculation, and I would say maybe the, with the word investment, also isn't appropriate here. This is all speculation. Nothing's being invested in. Uh, like, you fire a brick, that's an investment in a brick for the future, but you know, just throwing that stuff away is 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 part of a, an extractive uh, economy that's not based in any sort of circularity. So, um, just a just a couple of of, of other quick things um, is that another term that's maybe missing is the salvage yard. Uh, you talk about the materials library, but the salvage yard is a place of beauty. It's like a museum. Um, and so there's actually a, a, a kind of aesthetic attraction there that you would never find at a landfill. Uh, so I think you also have that to, to work with. Uh, and anyone who's ever been to a salvage yard will, will, will recognize that, just how much fun it is to go. Uh, so it, it, even in that recycling process, reusing process, there's magic. Uh, so, so there's something about reintroducing magic into these processes that, 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 that's also part of this. Um, all of this fits into really old ideas about urbanism. Um, Roberta Grant, Brandis Gratz was writing uh, in The Living City years ago about practices of incrementalism, about building the city kind of more slowly and incrementally so that processes of change aren't cataclysmic for communities. Uh, so, so that, I think, is something that comes in. And there's uh, also Jane Hutton's uh, work with reciprocal landscapes that talks about material flows that I think can really tie in uh, with, with the work that you're doing. Um, so, so what I would uh, encourage you, I think, is even when you're finished with your degree, don't abandon these approaches because this is really the future, I think. So when you are figuring out how you practice in the future, bear in mind that there's a long history that, you know, the modernists were giving instructions for how to use their buildings because they knew people wouldn't understand them. So even that is, is such a valuable thing to hold on to. Um, and, and I think using this activist practice of going out and identifying sites and working with communities to remove yourself from these cycles of commodification and financialization uh, is, 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 is a goal you can work towards in your career. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I'm really impressed on the level of details and just the thoroughness of the research that was made. Um, well, apart from what was already said, uh, I can probably uh, add a bit about you know the feeling that uh, 
there is a slight feeling that the things that you are doing, just the project itself, is a bit static, so to say. Like, you know, we always see this ideal cycle and ideal diagram that you are showing where all the actors have no conflict between each other. But because the first questions that arise to me when you were talking about, like, just, just the start of the retrofit ideas into this particular district in Liverpool and about the fact that they managed to have the community ownership yeah, and the trust, the land trust. And this is, as was already said, is the reason why it could happen actually. But I, I would be really interested to see if like, we could um, propose a sort of a conflict. Yeah? Imagine that the uh, owners, right, they, they might not agree on some things and things like that, how it would work then. And the other thing is that is particularly interesting to me also about the ideal picture that the project is um, drawing and unfolding, which it probably should be so as we are envisioning, right, the, the future that, that should be kind of uh, nearly idealistic, but it probably won't be. And now I would also think about like who's responsible on all those data collection and storage and like you've mentioned the universities the construction companies um the uh, like the recycling companies and all all those the, the cycle but there is an owner right who is in the middle of all those interests and um, what i would love to see and hear probably is a bit more touchy feeling about who is this owner actually and what is this society and then i ask myself that probably you know when it, you have very beautiful and amazing drawings and you have like the housing typologies but when we talk about a community it's something a, a bit more rather than just the housing typologies and like what are the kinds of urban uh, typologies are there and can be there and that you as an architect see uh, and as an urban planner see that should appear there that if we are making it for the future this definitely won't be static any longer and as you had in the very beginning the example this amazing example of a greenhouse and an old victorian house it's just you know to push it a bit further probably yeah just to to be able to see like what are the other types that are available to appear through this beautiful scheme yeah thank you yeah thank you um <coughs> i echo all the all the praise and I, I really enjoyed it and it looked amazing um and i really like the attention to materiality i think it articulates a lot with emergent ways of thinking about uh how people are and ecological economics and, and degrowth. This is a really interesting sort of uh, connection, which I, I've never really given much thought. It's not really my area of expertise, but but I, I, I would also follow on from those previous comments, just in terms of substantiating a little bit how some of those diagrams work in practice. Um, it's really great to see engagement with public common partnerships. I think probably a little bit of attention to why a public common partnership is different to a community land trust might be helpful. Um, and what is quite important about public common partnership, in my, in my opinion at least, is the capacity that they have to generate surplus and therefore move forward in, move forward in time, rather than, as many things do, like community lunch at the moment, rely on volunteers and luck and the right circumstances happening. A public commons partnership, in theory, can, can be a robust organisational model for surplus generation and expansion. And you talked a little bit about that future rollout across CLTs in, in Liverpool that are also affected by similar processes. but that capacity to expand into the future in this current moment requires resources, financial resources, and a PCP is, is, is good at doing that. So just maybe thinking a little bit more about how the PCP aspect uh, serves to reproduce these good, good things in, in the future, um, because that question of how uh, capital, social capital and financial capital is generated within this was, 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 was slightly lacking, although it's really complicated. I don't expect you to <laughs> solve that, but just acknowledgement of the fact that, yeah, still there will be money circulating in these systems and, and, and being a little bit more precise with when talking about PCPs because a collaboration between a university, a, a local authority and a private company can, it's not really a public commons partnership. There's not really a commons sort of community organisation involved in that, although I appreciate that the CLT is there and, and is, in this instance is a sort of a, a vital part of this sort of organisational ecology, but just a little bit more precision when, when talking about that, because there's some great stuff about it that you haven't included, which could make it even better. Yeah, but otherwise, great. Thank you, Bradley. That was really nice. I would like to just add something to, to what the three of them have said. Uh, to start with your comment, uh, 
one thing which you could look at in relation to exactly those last comments is the, uh, called the local trust. It's an extremely interesting phenomenon. I don't know whether you know it. Uh, they, are, they, have, they, they managed to get some capital and a big amount of money, millions, uh, from some kind of lottery. I, I can't remember details anyway. And what they did is they, they so the, the bidding could go, any community, this one or anyone up and down the land in UK, could bid for a big chunk of money, million each, one million each, uh, and they would have six years to spend it in whatever way they wanted. So it's a fantastic, concrete experiment of what happened. That takes me to your time, uh, to your point about uh, there is no, no homogeneous society, not even in, in Liverpool, in that street of, of residential street. So that comes out, of course, in, the, in this experience. It's extremely interesting to see. It's lots of them, I think about 60 or so communities. So they have a fantastic, fantastic empirical database of cases which you can look at, because at the moment, they're about two thirds through this process. And they are very keen. They have a web website which is worth looking at, because they do a lot of feedback, a lot of action research, and so on, to show how these different groups are using this money and how they negotiate with each other, how to use it, when to use it, and so on, who should benefit and all that sort of stuff. It's extremely interesting. It's a, a unique experiment. I don't know another one <laughs> like that. So I think that's really worth looking at. The other thing which, which again, I, I would like to mention is, uh, you know, the, the right to repair. Because as you said about, about the skills and the de-skilling and all that sort of thing, uh, I mean, my, my friend and colleague with whom we studied at UCL many, many years ago, she, she is professor of, of uh, construction, labor relations in the construction sector at the University of Westminster. And she has done extremely interesting action research on that, exactly, on how you prevent the de-skilling, how you are, and she works with the trade unions, she works with the, with the, with the various trades and so on. And, and uh, across the world, by the way, I mean, they started in UK, they did all the EU research, and, they, and now she, she works with Canada and so on. Another thing worth looking at, because their stuff is very open, so you just go on the website, pro-PREB, and, and that's, that's the, all their projects are there and so on. So I think this, these empirical, uh, you know, experiences are very important, because I mean, like Fleberg in his article said, you know, I mean, all these kind of grants, uh, theories and stuff like that, which the uh, academes uh, are so keen about, he says, actually, forget it, because you have to start with a case study, and that's why the case study is so unique and important. I mean, it's a very interesting piece of writing as well, of, of a chap who is a professor in, in Olberg, Ol, yes, anyway. No, oh, Aarhus, that's it. So that's another thing which is really worth having look, a look at because he's, he's quite radical and he's actually in, in doing these things, you know, and showing how, how you can look at and learn in a different way. This is very much connected with, with, with your approach, I think. So that, those are kind of things which might, might be useful for you to, to, to follow up. You know. Can I add something? Um, this is to actually to add to something that Anastasia said, um, which is about how you organize the, 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 the network. And what's been really interesting watching Twitter's uh, decline is the, the fragility of centralized uh, uh, management of digital um, goods. And the Fediverse has emerged into people's consciousness as, as a new sort of possibility. So we're, Mastodon is the one that's the most visible, but there are now distributed and federated local server-based uh, networks to replace just about everything. Facebook, Instagram, there, there, there are now kind of radical alternatives to each one. Um, so, and, and a Fediverse works just like the post office does, right? You don't have to have a centralized post office for the whole world. Each local area manages its own postal delivery and everything works. So that's perhaps one way of, of looking at it. And I think using the blockchain as a way to track materials is an obvious uh, move. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Bradley. Uh, I think, I mean, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to uh, working with Bradley, especially because it's kind of the first year we're uh, working with this topic, no? And there's obviously many strands, no? That we can uh, perhaps continue as a program uh, developing. I mean, the idea of the self discharge or you know the, the right to repair uh, and all these issues, like uh, diving into more detail of. Uh, 
public common partnerships, no, and how they can affect this development of these are, uh, you know, a, num a number of labor, no, uh, and how uh, labor is, you know, something that hasn't been really touched upon. Right, there's a lot of issues about material, where it's coming from, where is it going, but not necessarily the labor that goes into all these different stages. So I think at least uh, there's, you know, a good. Uh, anchor point, let's say, at least for the program, not to develop uh, uh, research. And I think what Bradley has done is something uh, very important for us, no? especially in the frame of the Green New Deal, no? looking at practices that work uh, with slow practices, no? like such as the construct, because it's very slow, like there's a lot of labor time necessary that doesn't fit with the system that we're living right now today. So that's important for us. And well, thank you very much, everyone, for the comments. Uh, so. We'll see the next team now. Thank you very much. The areas that uh, starts from the fifties, nineteen six, when the first book that contains potato appeared, and in this period, aristocrats were the main potato eat, uh, eaters. Potatoes were mainly made into pies and uh, cooked with very expensive spices such as uh, uh, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, and the cinnamon. Uh, for those arito aristocrats, potatoes were only an expensive alternative to the turnips. This didn't mean potatoes were loved by this uh, by the whales, just as a Robert, Robert Smith writes in his book, it includes the direction to be the potatoes so finely as not to be discovered what they are. Now let's look at the garden. In this period, potatoes were cultivated in the gardens, symbolizing the wealth of the nobility. And the second place, the second phrase starts from the starts from the 18th century. In this period, uh, potatoes, because of the pro uh, promotion by the politicians, potatoes was mainly served for the poor. And they were the potato soup was the main dishes, and you could also add the turnips and the meat and rice into the soup. Compared with the spicy sprinkled pie favored by the aristocrats, potato soup focused more on the satiety, so they were loved and praised a lot by the poor, but for the landowners, they hated potatoes because they think uh, potatoes made their laborious so self-sufficient that they had no incentive to work. And they also believed that potatoes took too much nutrients from the soil. And in this period, potatoes was moved from the home garden to the open field. The third period starts in the 19th century because of the promotion by the politicians. Potatoes fed a larger population and contributed to the Industrial Revolution. The industrial advances gradually changed the way potatoes were cultivated in turn. So in this period, a great number of receipts were created for, to serve for the middle class. And the cooking method became abandoned. And there are some uh, receipt books start to introduce the receipts with a strong uh, regional characteristic. And in this period, the soup and the bread and the fries are the main particular dishes. They were still popular among the workers, but the negative attitudes towards the potato intensified in this period, and the politician criticized the, the potato eaters with the lazy potato blood. And in this period, because of industrial graduation, uh, in industrial revolution, machines and the, um, fertilizers start to be used in potato cultivation. And the last period starts in the 20th century. It is worth noting that because of the development of the uh, food processing industry, the processed potatoes, uh, the consumption of processed potatoes start to rise and the uh, consumption of fresh potatoes keep falling. And uh, uh, potatoes has become a highly commercialized and intensive crop, and uh, it, it means the farmland is dominated by the single crop. It's kind of frozen. Frozen. 
just one second. So after I look into the history, I realize that food, food is not just something that sustains human life. It is connected to, to one end to the field, hence the soil, the variety, the landscape, and even the planet. And at a, another end, food is connected to the field that's the cuisine, our emotion, the politics, and finally the culture. But in today's globalized world, the food has become a dangerous, dangerous weapon controlled by the multinational companies. This spread all over the world and uh, 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 control like 90% of the global food trade and they use free trade to, dis uh, to destroy the local food system and drive out local small farmers. But it is a small farmer who should be the leader as they uh, produce 80% of the food with 30% of the land. The potato farmers in UK also facing a uh, shrinking industry, the number of, uh, there are fewer potato growers, the number of which uh, has fallen from 70,000 to 3,000. And uh, in contrast, the, the size of farmer, the, the size of farm is getting bigger. And this is a heavy burden for the small farmer. And it is undoubtedly the result of a, of a super food system controlled by the multinational companies. They, pro, they applying seeds and machines, fertilizer and pesticides, and also occupying the processing and the retailing segment downstream the production chain. Five varieties of potato in the UK, but you can only buy very common ones in the supermarket. And I know that there is a farmer's market in the Maribone every weekend, and there is a grower from Kent selling his unique potatoes that all the customers are curious about them. So I went to visit them last year, and uh, I was told that they are the only special potato growers in the southeast part of the England. And the figures from, from AHDB also prove that, uh, as you can see in, the, in this picture, Mary's, Pi uh, Mary's Piper are growing on a far more actor than the second place. So this means we are, we are growing and buying limited kinds of potatoes and we are shaping, up, we are creating our landscape and culture in the box provided by these companies. Our food sovereignty is not in our hands. So let's look at these unique potatoes. Uh, they are grown on special soils and bred to take on special shapes, colors, and flavors. And we also have some native, native heritage potatoes, and they are a best answer of some kind of cooking method. And some of them are on the verge of extinction, but most people have no idea about this. And when I was doing this research, I found Pembrokeshire, we are full of potential. And in addition to the special particular variety, the Pembrokeshire Early, there is also a food company called Puffin Produce, made up of the local small potato farmers, and also a food park planned by the Welsh government. 
the government is planning to build a food park on a 23 hectare site and as a showcase for the for the small food producers. And this food park is located at the urban boundary to the Harbor for West. And it is surrounded by the car sail shop. And there is also a high school outside the site. And there is also a water channel run into site. And last year, my MSC, uh, my MSC teammates and I went on a field trip. And uh, this is a review of food park. It has not been started yet. But we find that the residents here care about their local food. And we spoke to a farmer who runs a big farm. This is what his farm, farm looks like. And uh, uh, he is very proud of the unique potato variety. So what we found gave us some idea about the food park. And previously, we care about the struggles that uh, small farmers have faced. So we researched about the uh, development of food sovereignty movement in the UK and uh, investigate a lot about the organization that protects small farmers and their food sovereignty. And combined with our experience in the food park, we come an idea of a, a cooperative farmer-led food park. And according to this calendar, we start from a processing workshop and finally to grow, uh, finally grow to have a farmer's market and the recycling workshop, machinery library, crop library, soil lab, and some fields. And uh, after the research about the history, I realized that uh, food sovereignty is not isolated, so I, I'd like to connect the food with, with the field and the table. So as the only MR student, I continued my design of the park and decided to make the uh, field kitchen and the fields as a core. And there are at least seven types of potatoes were uh, are grown in the food park and they have different growing needs, they have different uh, requirements for the soil and the, the light, so I should, uh, I need to create the right uh, environment for each of them. So here I have the farmland first and then the buildings and wind rooms were put into the site. They create the shadow for all the crops and the uh, uh, swells are uh, ditches along the contour lines uh, combined with the water channel. They make the soil mass more moist. So finally, the farmland is divided into the wet and dry and the full sun and the shaded area. After that, uh, like the uh, the, character, the characteristic of the, each potato and the growing needs of each companion plant work together to determine the combination of this companion plant and the potato. As you can see, uh, these companion plants and the potatoes were, were, are grown in different plots and they are put together into different dishes and each plot can yield a special potato dishes. And next, I'll, and I'm going to take one field as an example to illustrate, to explain how the field works. The, uh, the, the box builder and the sculpting tools will uh, act as a wind crease, and the slabs here create an underground reservoir, and uh, which could attract the um, more organic matters and make the soil more higher and active. And these companion plants act as natural uh, insecticides for the plants. And the next. The nasturtiums uh, attract beneficial insects and potatoes and the, uh, the garlic and horseradish repel pests and the basil and onion do not compete with the potatoes. And the wood board here illustrates uh, the kind of potatoes grown here and what kind of dishes could be made from this field. Unlike the industrial potato field, all these companion plants work and uh, with these potatoes, 
um, made for a really and colorful farmland landscape, changing with the season. And uh, there's also an, uh, an another field worked as a, a control group, and all the visitors can test the soil from two fields and they can come back, make a comparison. They can easily find that soil from the industrial farmland is less likely because you can find less fungi and organic matters. And next, let me do a quick introduction about these buildings. Uh, the processing workshop provides all these visitors with potato products in addition to the food. They can also buy the soap, the potato soap, the potato milk, and the beauty products. And the idea about polytano comes from another experience of a, of a small farm. Uh, there is a small farm close to Ice Fort, and uh, Ed runs his small farm. You can see the landscape here is quite different with a uh, big farm in the wheels. And he has a polytunnel. My teammates and I sat in his polytunnel around the table and surrounded by the crops, talking about his small farm and having a coffee together. I really enjoyed this experience. So the polytunnel on the farmland is also a, a crop library and also can accommodate people to have a break. And the farmer's market is where they treat with the customer and also held the food festival. And this is a field kitchen. It consists of two parts. The building on the left is uh, uh, mainly open for the children. And the building on the right is uh, uh, more like a restaurant. And, uh, and the field kitchen is in partnership with the high school outside the food park and all these teenagers can learn how to cook healthy food regularly and they can also uh, learn to grow the crops in these uh, indoor gardens. And the first floor is a place where for the uh, kitchen enthusiasts to work on the uh, creative recipes. And this field kitchen will come the uh, community residents and chefs to enjoy, to sample the new food here and also hold a food festival. And this part is a good viewing platform and downstairs, downstairs is a corridor along the lake. And they also recycle tires from the car shop outside to work as a container for growing potatoes. And as I mentioned before, the processed potatoes is taking the place of fresh potatoes and implicit it is a distortion of food culture by the companies. So the role of the food park is to connect the farm to the table and enrich the community's table with companion plants and those, uh, those potatoes and also inspire young people to take an interest in farming and then feed the small farmers and also shape a unique and living Pembrokeshire food culture. And the exploration of, food, of history illustrates how the food is how the food reflects the social cultural parameters of our era and how it is how it is possible to paint the agriculture landscape. But history also shows us that the food we eat can easily be altered by external factors. So the control the control of farmers and supermarkets by those giant food companies has confined consumers to narrow boxes that deny, deny them access to abundant food and therefore uh, make them uh, allowing food culture to be flattened. So the food park is going to break, break these confines. On the one hand, food park returns food sovereignty to the consumers and, and farmers, giving them a wide right range of choices. And on the other hand, food park is dedicated, uh, dedicated to developing a new food culture. And uh, in, uh, in the Welsh government's original plan, food park was to be a showcase for the, for the small food processors, but now food park is 
uh, connect the farmland landscape with our tables and the farmers and the community. So food park enables the, the consumers to see how our table are responding to a farmland and changing the way they eat and uh, becoming the new source of uh, food culture. That's, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Meg, and um, thank you for continuing some of this work, which I've enjoyed seeing develop over the course of the last uh, year or so. And it's interesting to see uh, the new stuff that's come in, um, particularly around some of the perhaps greater historical depth. And one first comment, perhaps, in that regard, is I think if you do want to foreground some of that history, which I, which I, which I find really interesting, to connect it perhaps a bit better to some of the second section would be to discuss how those histories affected some of the spatial forms associated with agriculture and the land and the landscape. I think you hinted at it, but I think you could make it a little bit more explicit in terms of how that would have manifested itself in, in the land and, and in the landscape. That idea of self-sufficiency, for example, speaks to you know small um, individually run or family run growing plots and then later you get to industri industrial revolution so just to, yeah make it a little bit more connected because we go a little bit from the history to then to the, some of the architectural and, and, and landscape questions um, but I think you can connect that a bit better by bringing some of the second half into the first half and I know that the, that the food hub idea was developed quite extensively um, in the initial in the initial project um, but I think you can take some of this stuff that was done there and, and, and bring it into this in terms of how it's going to work and why it's going to succeed or why it could succeed in the future. Um, and that needs, that requires sort of consideration of the, the, some of the processes which will determine how it works and, and why. And then also in that vein, sort of situating your ideas uh, within that framework is it a project? Is it a project that you're proposing be taken up by the people who run the food park? Is it conditional to the establishment of the food park to have to have this theme? So, how does these speculative ideas fit into this? If this is something that were to to materialise, if, if if you see what I mean, those would be my, my two sort of main comments. Substantiating and connecting the first half, the historical element with the second half, and um, injecting some of that consideration of organization and practicality and situating your own work as a designer within this sort of imagined trajectory. Um, but I thank you, really, really enjoyed it. So, thank you. Thank you very much for your work. I, th I think it's amazing, and for some reason I don't know why, but uh, the food question seems to be much more tangible to me rather than you know the reuse of constructional materials. Although we all know that they bring much more CO2 than anything else in the world, but still, this matter is not yet there apart from the bricks that are already there, and we can sort of have time to think about what to do with them. And in today's vividly changing uh, climate situation and the pollution situation, this is a very tangible thing. And the first question that I want to ask you is that, um, how do you think, is it actually possible to discuss the food chain locally only? Because uh, if you know that most of the potatoes that are being sold in British supermarkets, yes, they're British potatoes, but they're not grown in Britain. I mean, the seeds are being prepared in Great Britain, and I myself, I, you know, just know some agricultural specialists. Uh, they do a lot of experimenting in Norfolk, and they're preparing British seeds, potatoes, to be grown in Northern Africa, and then being brought back to Tesco, and etc. Yeah, and this is the bit that I'm really missing because when you show the map, yeah, and about and the, the map of the food change, uh, food chain, and how it was changing. This, this thing is really missing because if we imagine yeah, how, how great the impact of all this uh, food moving around the planet yeah, and, uh, and the economical impact on the local farmers of this food being grown outside of the country is, is just terrible, yeah, it's insane. And um, the other thing that uh, I think is, is interesting to have a look at if, if, if you still have an, an opportunity is to dig a bit more about the, the soil that you are using in the project in, in Wales because you have a lot of interesting maps about the features which are important for the agricultural plot like the solar radiation, where the water features are, where the trees grow so you have shadow there but then you say that all the um, types of uh, different 
uh, potatoes, they require specific soil. So how it is related yeah, to the site, it's not obvious. And the other bit which is absolutely fascinating is that today we can produce soil. I mean, we have, I mean, as humanity, we have technologies to do soil from compost, from uh, garbage, from like, you know, with the help of um, contemporary technology. So this is also a thing that I would I would say it is inside this cycle, yeah, that you are discussing, because we are obviously talk, not talking about the agriculture as it was 500 years ago, yeah, we are not, yeah, like, moving backwards, we are moving forward, and this is a thing to, I think, to, to keep in mind, yeah, like, what is the whole picture for the future that you would like to implement. Um, yeah, and the last but not the least is the topography because it's it's super interesting. You've talked, and and this is very nice that you've discovered uh, how different topologies of plants grow together and how they influence each other. But there is more than that: is how the topography on which you grow and how subtle changes in this topo topography yeah, change how how everything grows. Um, and then the. Um, also the animals, yeah, because they're always somewhere, they're on the farm and they also influence the whole process and then it becomes like a biodynamic cycle, how you can use the impact that farm animals can do and uh, for fertilizing, for protecting, uh, for keeping, I don't know, away the slugs with uh, uh, like and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's you know like an I see no boundary with the uh, with the research and the project that that may c continue here. And I wish that in your professional life you would touch this topic as they're very vulnerable today. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Mika. Um, there, there was an interesting connection, I think, between your presentation and Bradley's in that I was thinking about the ways in which food fashions and food fads keep this kind of churn happening, which, which means that all growers are kind of on the back foot trying to catch up with, you know, what the next big thing is. Is it argan oil? Is it, you know, uh, and, and at the same time that destabilizes local food cultures in the way that argan oil production has destabilized Moroccan food sources and the way the, the, the trend for quinoa uh, destabilized uh, traditional agriculture in South America. So there's a kind of interesting link there, I think. Um, these projects, I think in many ways, work from the case study to help to introduce much larger ideas. So, so you have a couple of sort of wedges. You talk about the potato and you talk about this very sort of local project. And, and for me, actually, something that, that, that's kind of a missing step is to translate that back into some generalities that you can say, this is maybe how we can rethink the relationship between city and countryside and how this might be a template for a larger uh, scale form, form of working. Um, and, and, and that's maybe not a, a fault with the project as much as it is that it begins to hint at some possibilities and how this unfolds to a certain extent. Um, so for example, there's a big question uh, about the quality of rural life. Right? We've been so concentrated on the city and urbanization that ruralism is, is something that we forget to, 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 to see as a category. Um, and one of the reasons why that there aren't a lot of small farms is that the quality of rural life has been systematically destroyed. So how do we make rural life more convivial? How do we make, you know, how do we use technologies to connect people in, in rural locations so that people will actually want to be there instead of this kind of lonely thing that rural life has, has become? So I think that's a, that's a big question. Um, there are a number of other things that, that kind of unfold from this, questions of intercropping, uh, new ideas about food forests, um, and old ideas about crop rotation and fallowing, which I, I think are really important about understanding land use. And you know, in the United States, and you know, in many places, practices of fallowing have been abandoned. So, so land is just put into this constant extractive productive cycle. Um, as the questions kind of 
expand outwards, I, I think that there's a real need to consider not just the, the, the farm, the individual farm, but small and medium-sized enterprise, which is the kind of thing that you're speaking about with production. Um, and maybe some of this needs to be pulled apart again. Thinking about how intensive mixed farming can happen on the urban fringe and be connected to production and processing facilities in the city itself where those processes are needed and to, to, to reduce the food miles which are held in the distribution system um, is, is another kind of important uh, question. So, uh, and the question of mixed farming also makes me wonder where the animals are in this because mixed farming really does need animals. You need the manure, you need the, the grazing as part of this process. So I think bringing that in would be a, a logical uh, next step. And then finally, uh, just, a, just a couple of, of things is that as with Bradley's topic, I think the term that's at the core of your work is maybe the wrong one. For me, sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty takes us far too quickly into ideas of nationalism and separatism and competitive individualism. And there is something fundamentally about, about food and food production, which involves sharing. Um, so sovereignty for me is a slightly poisonous idea um, because it says we can go it alone. It's very Brexity. Uh, so maybe to shift to use a term that's got more historical sheen to it, like regionalism or bioregionalism, uh, might be a better foundation for your project than this, than this idea of sovereignty. And then finally, if you haven't seen Agnes Varda's film, The Gleaners and I, where the potato features as like, it's, it's one of the stars of the film, uh, you definitely need to watch that. And if you haven't made a visit to the Museum of English Rural Life in Reading, you definitely need to go there as well. Well, I follow you. I mean, I let you talk before because this is not my world. I am a completely unreformed townie. So, so, but that's why I would like to make the connection. I, I found it very interesting, very detailed research, very, very thorough. I mean, really, fun, very, very, I'm very, very impressed. And I have learned something about potatoes and other stuff. But I have, so, as an, a lay person, uh, I have just two questions about that particular aspect and then I would like to relate it to the bigger picture which, which I, where I slightly disagree with, with the last speaker and I will explain why. But I mean the two things which struck me is, is uh, really the biodiversity. Okay you have the different type of potatoes but that's potatoes you know and it's a very small scale so there is, a, there is an, an issue of critical mass even today, and as you say, you can't go back to the 16th or, the, or, or 8th century. That's, this time is over. And that makes me think of Harari's uh, perspective of, of no humans anymore at all. Homo sapiens is completely dispensable uh, because techno will do everything. The robot and the artificial intelligence, watch it because you will be still alive. I won't, thank goodness, in that absolute uh, horror, horror world. Uh, but you have shown in the history the, the industrialization of, of, of agriculture, that's exactly step by step. It actually confirms his, his vision, I have to say. So how do you uh, compensate that or have a parallel or an alternative uh, option which you are looking for, of course, and there I agree with you, sovereignty has the kind of notion of autarky. You know, we are in our little world and we satisfy ourselves, everything is self-contained. Well, that's not what will happen, absolutely not. And, and there's the critical mass ain't there for that, absolutely not. So there is another model one has to in invent. I don't think it is invented yet, but... And that brings me to my other point is I do not see this separation between the rural and the urban anymore. I mean, if you look at, at a very long-standing radio show, which is called The Archers. I don't know whether you know that, but it's worth listening because it's, it's on radio for every day. So, bo, bo, bo. 
But this is, for sociologists, a very interesting thing to see because what they're doing, they're obviously it's focused on agriculture, it's focused on uh, all that the rural life, but it isn't rural life. It is completely urban in many senses because what they are doing, they're going on holiday to, to, to Canaries and so forth and so on. I mean, it's the, the whole lifestyle, they get divorced, they do all sorts of other things. You know, so this kind of ideal of the, the farmland, living with nature and all that sort of thing, it's just gone. I mean, in our world, certainly, it's not there. So how do you actually look at this connection between, if there is an interdependence, it's there already, how to make positive use of that? And I think your last pictures about the table and, and the, the intermediary place which, where you work and the actual growing, that is one of the connections, which, which is, you even showed a, a, an aerial picture of, of, of fringe of a city. I think that is very much where you, where you can do some kind of thinking of how you can create this connection in a more interactive way so that you know, the ter urbanites can actually have seen a cow, a real one, not just on television, and, and vice versa. And so that brings me to my, my last point about the, the other project, which was very ungreen. I mean, there was not a piece of grass in that street, you know. So how, and people try to do sort of urban agriculture even on the, uh, on the uh, an edge of a, of, a, of a pavement and so on. Uh, how could you, some of these ideas of, of you know, learning again about nature, about biodiversity, of how to handle that, uh, to, to, to these kind of places. I think that would be a, a real challenge, a very interesting to say, well, not just build something new in between, but how could you, it's not one either or, it's, it's together, it's and or, I think. And then just a question of the naive, he said, well, what about diseases, you know, I mean, the, 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 when I'm at my little garden, I mean, suddenly my geraniums get black, black stop spots and because there's something wrong with the gene or something, and I can't do anything about it. So I'm sure you know, the, the disease is there. So how, how would you cope with that, just you know, to, to actually tame it and, and so on? So that's, sorry, as a lay person, that's my comment. Um, I'm going to pick up on some of those comments and, 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 and come back. <laughs> sorry, uh, if we're pressed for time, I'm afraid I'd be to say. Um, We've talked about food sovereignty on a number of occasions when we've discussed this in the past, and I would gently push back against the, the, the previous comments and defend that term as, as something which is historically situated in a, in a broader global movement, which, 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 which we have discussed. Um, but to, to critique it, I think, is valid, and to consider that, that some of those criticisms in light of the very different context in Pembrokeshire than where perhaps the food sovereignty movement has emerged amongst peasant and indigenous communities is important. I'd also like to be motivated by the, 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 the comments from, from Tim and Anastasia on the ag agronomic questions. Highlight the fact that when you are designing an agronomic environment or an agricultural environment, it's very different to designing a built environment as far as it's going to change all the time. And some things are going to work and some things are going to not work. And if they don't work, they're going to die and it's going to look different. So in doing that, in you, what you present is quite prescriptive in terms of the sort of selection of, of, of crops which you'd grow with potatoes. But it would be better to think about the processes of developing systems rather than uh, just having the suggestions yourself, or at least mention that this could be a starting point for experimentation, because that's much more, it's much more organic, and or, or, no pun intended, it's much more dynamic as well as the built environment when you're designing or considering agricultural landscapes. That would be my, my uh, addition, and yeah, uh, thank you again. <laughs> it is. I'm very, very sorry. It is. Was one one minute because uh, the thing that we all have emphasized in the previous project was about the ownership and the community ownership. And I think the bit which is necessary here as well is to foresee if we talk about community agriculture, how these ownership schemes would work. If we imagine that not all the people have access to land, not all the people have sufficient time or money or income or whatever for food, and which is as we know, we probably in 50 years will not have, have enough food on the planet to feed the people, the population. So like how those schemes could work about sharing and like the productivity, the labor in, in, embedded into it, and then how the distribution is happening. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm, hello everyone, I'm Sarah and my teammate is... I'm Ting. Our project is called the Peat Scotland and as you can see from the title, it's based on peat or peatlands. 
it functions on various scales, starting with the, with the global scale and then scaling down to the microscopic scale. Our focus is on the transparency of land ownership, transformation of land management, and the transition to a real zero in Scotland. We're going to start our presentation by the question of what are peatlands? Peatlands are precious landscapes. Using our senses, we can recognize and interact with them. They are so you can see, feel, and hear the water in them. They are smelly. Peatlands can have a strong organic smell. This is peat. They are dark. As you dig deeper, they get darker in color. Landscapes, converting them from unique places into generic abstract calculations. So net zero policy has catered for greenwashing, such as carbon offsetting strategies used by major landowners in Scotland, leading to land grabbing and the rise of green lights. And one striking example is Shed, Shed's project in Glengarry, Scotland. It is funding a five million pound project done and developed by the Forestry and Land uh, Commission, Forestry and Land in Scotland, uh, which is a public agency. Uh, planting trees on public land and therefore putting more pressure on community-owned lands in a place where there is unequal distribution of land. Next, Net Zero Policy has also catered for the displacement of fragile communities and this is a project of a wind turbine in India that was erected and therefore displaced local people. And finally, catering to major land use conflicts. So we question, are these projects adapted to actual site conditions and is the intersection of trees with other land uses still valid to achieve net zero? So we have looked into this conflict and mapped out woodlands and peatlands because they are the major terrestrial carbon sinks of the globe. Due to their intersection, they have lost their ability to sequester carbon and have become carbon emitters. We have mapped peatlands in red and woodlands in green. And this conflict can be clearly monitored in the UK, where 12% of land is classified as peatlands. And by zooming into the UK, we have also marked peatlands, woodlands, and their intersection, intersection, all three categories most notable in Scotland. This conflict is not recent. Since the early 1900s and since the formation of the Forestry Commission, peatlands were considered as wastelands. So going back to the question of what are peatlands, defined by International Peace Society, peatlands are terrestrial wetlands ecosystems in which waterlogged conditions prevent the plant material from fully decomposing. Consequently, the production of this organic matter incites its decomposition, and which results in a net accumulation of peat. However, the importance of this uh, peatland is dependent on the health and functioning of these microorganisms. They create and live within it. These creatures, they are very ancient and old, you can see here, and then provide an images of how unique of these soils. Tackling the peatland uh, microbiome communities allow us to, under to develop an alternative understanding of this uh, ecosystem that goes beyond the carbon calculation and sequestration, uh, or as a perceiving as a global soil carbon stock. And you can see this one, this is the diatom, and they um, found in the water and peat soil, and also for the carbon absorption. So look, by looking at the peat's uh, peatland section, it accumulates one millimeter right, um, uh, of organic matter per year, and it uh, takes around 3,000 years to form three meters of the peat. 
And these are the several plants and animals homes, and then the dominant one is the sphagnumos. And the water table here is usually quite high. So in the UK, they have the uh, complex uh, combination of the peatland like blanket bog and rice bog and fence. Uh, however, the peatland has the demonstrate. So we're showing the uh, existing conflict section of the afforestation, afforestation and then uh, peak extraction and wind farms and drainage here. So this is showing the peak extraction for whiskey. And then the images of conflict of the non-native tree on peatland. So let's talk about uh, our land management, land management scheme, which is our um, proposals. So we end up developing the land policy for a transition to a real zero. To, uh, that will apply through an interface uh, platform. This platform will uh, allow the various means of the land assessment and provide a community menu and then carbon tax calculation also the land management strategies. Before we get to the tools and then the policy, we would like to discuss the, um, our engagement with the community organization in Scotland. Due to the concentrated land ownership, many landowners have the power over the land use and local communities. Making use of the land uh, landscape as the natural capital to sell uh, carbon credit and offset emissions. So we have met and collaborated with the several organizations you can see here. And then especially with the Jamia Trust, they have the, we have met through a meeting with them and side visit in Scotland with them. And also the breathing carbon, which is the study of uh, uh, dedicated to land managers to help make a decision regarding their land. And then based on the carbon calculations and would calculate carbon credits and then generally, generally from the landscape. So let's start with the policy part. Okay, so for the policy part, we work on the carbon emission land tax, which is a proposal by John Mayer Trust. The aim is to maximize the carbon, uh, the carbon sequestration potential of land in Scotland. It is usually addressing large landowners, and based on hectares, every landowner would be assessed for actual and potential carbon emission and sequestration, and would be placed in a taxing ban. They could move into lower tax bans by changing land use. So we have worked on this tax, and this is how it's applied. The lands are divided into lands over 500 hectares and lands below 500 hectares. For lands over 500 hectares, an initial tax is calculated, which is CELT1. If there is no change in management plan, a higher tax is calculated, which is CELT2. In this case, there could be the management or acquisition of land by community trusts or members. In case there is a change in management plan, a second tax is calculated, which is lower than the initial tax. In this case, if they are eligible, they can generate carbon credits in the future. As for lands below 500 hectares, if there is no change in management plan, no action is applied. However, if they change their management plan, they will be eligible to various funding schemes, either from the revenue collected from the tax or from existing funding schemes and provided, for example, by the Scottish government. In this case, they could also immediately generate carbon credits. However, in both cases of carbon credit generation, they would only offset unavoidable carbon credits at a local scale. So after ex the explanation of policy, we would like to talk about our tool. For testing this tool, we're choosing one of the sites in the Glen Nevis. So we have visited seven sites in the past months to better understand this landscape, to collect the soil sample to uh, this year, and then engage with the community. And then this site has most been in Scotland, England, but we focus on Glen Nevis in Scotland. So we are going to show you a video about our field tree, which is our site visit in Glen Glen Nevis Escape has an area of 1,369 hectares, with 40 hectares of bare feet found within the Glen Nevis site. It lies within the boundaries of Glen Nevis site of specific interest and a special area of conservation. These designations require consent for any activity that needs to take place on site. This site visit was very crucial in the project, since we were able to test our nine new site tools and to deeply understand the speciality of the site and its link with the various restoration projects and land management plans that take place. The historical understanding of the site's various land uses pretty much explains the current condition of the site. Experts say that the mountains in this state formed 420 million years ago due to the collision of continents. 
where the first human activity was traced back to the Neolithic Ages, approximately 12,000 years ago. And from the Middle Ages until the 18th century, Lindemus was utilized to create charcoal within burning platforms that can still be found on the estate. This was followed by livestock farming that was practiced for centuries and lasted up until the year 2000. I'm not sure what your opinion is on this effect, but you might get to see it here. Similarly, deer stalking started in the 18th century and still exists on site, but is being controlled by deer management plants. The current vegetation layer on the site reflects on the history of high grazing on this land. These stones are made of blue trees. The header seems to grow on there as well. And I can get the Since the year 2000, John Mayer Trust acquired the land and have focused on maintaining visiting paths and habitat restoration. During our site visit, we collected various water, soil, and moss samples that will be used later in the project. <coughs> So in order to spatialize the tax that we talked about, and by using the land of the site, we have developed a platform that will allow the users to register their lands, undertake a land assessment, and be provided with the right management plans. They can also engage with experts and community trusts. The platform has a structure of inputting land data, land assessment, carbon tax calculation, and future design. It starts with an overview page where the user can toggle through existing, ongoing, and complete projects in Scotland and engage with community members. Next, they are required to enter their land number and property information with job. They should also specify the ownership, and the aim of this feature is to collect data regarding land ownership in Scotland to create an, a map that would be public and accessible for all. The user can also press on neighboring lands or surrounding designation to better understand the context of their site. And by pressing on land morphology, the users can get a 3D understanding of their site, the features, and the topography. Next, the user is required to enter their land use, and computer-generated areas would show here. For example, in this case, the site has peatlands and woodlands. If they press on certain areas, details would show here. And for example, this area here is PT cultures. Next, we move to the land assessment part of the interface. The user should specify if they have any previous assessment or not. If yes, then they would enter the date, upload assessment reports and maps. If not, then they could book a meeting with an expert, download a community manual, apply for a toolkit, or get access to several video links. These video links could explain how the assessment can take place on site using the community manual. We're going to show a video that's a combination of all of these steps. This video is a combination of various assessment strategies that have been guessed without support. It can be done on-site and off-site. The structure of the video is highlighted by the icon on the left. On the left, it shows what test is taking place. At the bottom, it is related to the tools used. First, use of ArcGIS Maps or GPS to locate the site. This can be provided through the interface with all the necessary layers. Next, is the recombination of the site by vegetation layer and high water table was offers to the naked eye can be collected directly from the surface or by using the shuffle. This is followed using the digital meter to monitor the pH and moisture levels on site. Small amounts of spot levels can also be collected this way. Later we move to the small and to measure depth and black samples. So now require the use of smaller shuffle or your hands. Make sure the samples are tightly sealed. Next comes the barcode testing layer. Using your head, you are required to grab soil, squeeze it, and document the water dripping, the extrusion, and soil texture. Soil collection can go beyond the soil samples, and a section tube can be used to collect a one-to-one -one sample that will show the soil profile. Some sites, the pink probe is very useful. Documentation on site is very crucial and can facilitate to assessment resolution. One, as for other tasks such as the infiltration and aggregation, they can be done on site and off site. Infiltration test on site is as follows First, insert a secure container, fill it with water, and record the time needed for water to infiltrate. And for aggregation, by using two soil samples, immerse them with water, remove them and turn them over at night. Other documentation can be done off-site, such as filling a site documentation sheet. 
used to your sense of getting to smell, see, and touch the solar samples. Photo documentation is advising. So, after watching this video, user can double the menu. So, this community menu will bridge the gap between its uh, uh, community and their land. And then it's a way to allow them to understand about this precious landscape. And using their personal experience, and then, per and then the personal experience and sense, and rather than the up pure, the carbon credit calculation, the knowledge that will build throughout the uh, process can change the per people's perception to peatlands and then to de develop the habit of the caring and restoring this landscape. So, uh, the many past chapter related to the strategies to the identified peatlands. And then once they uh, allow the understanding of the peatland and the spot animals and the variety, also the woodland on the site and the microscopic pot. So after using this mapping, the site section will be computer generated by the uh, using the data and result collected by the community and then understand the supervision of the expert. And then site images will be used as the background to help the user to identify the site. And then when they press the button here, they will show the water, and then water will be highlighted here. And then the water, um, water location and water sample will be shown up. If they press the vegetation top layer, and also the hisa, the site condition of the vegetation will show, and it, in this case, it will be the hisa species. And then most species will be identified and then detailed, and then uh, identify which most will be. And then the side feature, another one, in this case, it will be the tree stumps. And also the soil section will be shown on layers. And then the sample section will be shown on the depth in the each layers. And then the sample collection will also be shown here and then identify the, um, their differences and the descriptions. And also the pH layers. And then um, after... Um, Following this the low tech analysis, a high tech one will show and it's done by the experts. And the microscopic part is the part of the high tech, and then we dis distribute to the uh, upper side and then the bottom layers. And the upper one it will be the carbon sequestration active and it's more funky and then it will be more acidic. But the bottom one will be more bacteria and higher pH, but it is more stable of the carbon. So let's move to the uh, high tech in the Google Earth engine map. And we have two layers, it's the moisture and then the vegetation layers. And the moisture layers is high water content here and then the variable vegetation. So after the low, low tech assessment and the results and the high tech one that have been explained previously, we get to the part of the carbon tax calculation. An initial tax at this stage is calculated where the area where the site is divided into areas each one is specifying how much carbon is being emitted. The platform also provides a carbon scale and a taxing band. The user needs to specify the area that they would like to work on, and in this case it's going to be area 2 because it's emitting 29 tons of CO2 per year. By pressing on this area, we get a zoom in into the site where the high carbon emission area is highlighted and the site features are shown. Experts then, through the interface, would suggest strategies related to peatlands, woodlands, deer management, and path repair. In our case, it is rewiping and revegetation on peatlands, deer management, woodland expansion, and path repair around it. Before we get into the details of the site, a discussion forum is also provided where the user can ask for, for voting from community members for expert suggestions and community comments. So by zooming in to the site, we have two bare peat areas that differ in depth, drainage, and vegetation. The user can check the peat depth on site, also the exposed peat, and the drainage lines that is causing this exposure on site. Next, they will be provided by a set of strategies related to the different areas, depending on drainage rates and peak depth. In this case, they are classified into damming and devegetation. For damming, we have several dams that are being used, which are timber, heather bay, and stone dam. And they can also press, in this case, add details that would provide them with material quantities and prices, and also access to existing restoration manuals in Scotland, such as ones done by peatland action. And after agreeing on all of the latter, a second tax is calculated, which is way lower than the initial one, because they decided to change their land use and their land management scheme. 
and the interface would also provide an image of the restoration process taking place. <coughs> And then this, in this step, will be show up the future scenario. In the future scenario, we can see the past repair here, and it will allow people to visit the peatlands and the gland levels. And this scenario will also show more revegetation and then spread the species like the cotton grass and then swamp animals. And then increase the water table and the bulb formation. Later through time, these peatlands become home of the several animal species like the poppy and the curlew. I'm happy then to come back to home. And later, user can upload images of the uh, restoration process. So, in conclusion, with more the sites involved, the Scottish policy and the community menu could be uh, still developed and involved to the change minds and build awareness and shape perceptions and connection with this landscape. The end is to democratize this landscape and there could be also scaled to a global scale and where the peatland in the future we can become the more global common. And we would like to thank for uh, John Muir Trust support and for publishing an article about our collaboration. And we also would like to thank uh, our teammates from previous team and then during previous turn and then for the support from this turn and then help and then guide us. And thank you everyone. This is the Peace Garden 2.0. I guess, I guess I'll start since I've got the microphone. Um, thank you. I, I, I loved seeing the, the, the bit with the quaking bog at the, at the beginning. When I was a student uh, years ago at the Rhode Island School of Design, I stood on a quaking bog in uh, Massachusetts. And it's the most amazing experience you have. You can't stop, otherwise you go straight in. Um, so yeah, a wonderful sort of, sort of visceral uh, showing of that. And there's a huge amount of material and inquiry and, and, and technical information um, contained in here. Um, I, I, I think there were a couple of things at the very beginning that were really valuable that you identified that peatlands are treated as generic abstracts in these carbon uh, uh, accounting programs, which is terrifying actually because what happens when you treat forests, for example, as, as generic abstracts as you get plantations that are meaningless in relation to the landscape and which have the, the power to displace people. Um, so uh, for me, there were a couple of things that maybe could have been foregrounded a little bit more. There, there, there was a, a sort of comfort with the technical and analytical sides of the, of the project which I think means that you didn't really get fully to the question of the aesthetics of peatlands and how you bring not just landowners uh, into a relationship with that land, but how you, ex how you interpret those landscapes for other visitors to those sites and, 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 and bring those qualities of the peatlands forward. Because once you get to know them, they're really, really beautiful. Um, and, and I think you know that, but, but actually the question of transmitting that is still, I think, a big question that, that, that remains to, to be answered. Um, the connections between peat and energy, uh, I think, were really interesting. You, you, you partially got there, and you, you were talking about whiskey production and things like that. I think the Irish context of peatlands is, is perhaps interesting to look at because there, uh, you know, it, it's much more explicit in Ireland that, that, that the, the peatlands were connected with, with energy production, mm -hmm. and now they continue to be because the battery farms uh, for renewable energy are now being located in the peatlands. Mm -hmm. so, so really interesting stuff going on, and there's a lot of research at the University of Dublin, uh, actually, that, that would be really good for that. There are some other places where I, where I worry the, the John Muir Trust's proposal of a, of a land tax, to me, doesn't necessarily reinvent the financial structures that are underpinning the problems of peatlands being treated as extractive. They, it, it takes us almost quickly back to abstractions and doesn't necessarily reinvent the, 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 the economics. So I think there might be more 
investigation done there about whether there are more radical uh, accounting practices that could be associated with, with, with peatlands rather than trying to tack something onto the existing <coughs> systems that's ameliorative rather than innovative. Um, the, uh, uh, the John Muir Trust itself, I, I wonder about, and, and maybe this is a question, how aware are they and how much do they take into account in their work of the toxic elements of John Muir's legacy in terms of racism, colonialism, emptying out of indigenous lands, um, those kinds of things. Are they, are they aware of that and are they working with that in their approaches to try and overcome that history or is that just kind of? I think yes. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. um, that kind of connects really interestingly to the work that perhaps Corinne Fowler is doing with the Colonial Countryside Project, you know, revealing these, 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 these toxic histories as much as kind of valuing some of the legacies from them. Uh, and then uh, uh, just um, a recommendation, I think, or two recommendations. Um, Laura Alice Watt has a wonderful book called The Paradox of Preservation, which talks about how people understand parklands and, and, and treat them and then how, um, it, it's, it's just a great book for thinking about the, the, all of the topics in general. And a new book uh, by Rosetta Elkin, who's uh, just now setting up the new landscape architecture program at Pratt in New York. Um, she has a new book uh, called Landscapes of Retreat, which talks about how you remove yourself from landscapes like this as part of the practice of climate change adaptation. So I think that would be really interesting. And then finally, uh, sorry I talk at length, um, the, it, it, what you presented is really a landscape management plan. Um, and I think starting with that and thinking about how a landscape management plan is packaged and presented and whether it has a set of organizing documents at the beginning that help to situate you and uh, is there, you know, I, I realize that there's an allergy to the master plan, but maybe is there something of master planning approaches that needs to be foregrounded at the beginning so that you can almost create a table of contents and a way of working through all the complexity that you presented us. Um, okay, who wants? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really impressed and I really enjoyed, you know, the scientific approach that you had and seeing you being there physically and so deep inside the peat soil is is really very pleasing and heartwarming, I can tell you. <laughs> I think only in this way of investigation we can uh, talk about things, realize things and then produce uh, produce things, right? And um, I would probably continue the idea about the value, yeah, because when you talk about the tax, first thing I ask myself, okay, to tax something, something needs to be valued, something needs to be evaluated. And the evaluation that you are showing um, is absolutely ecological, right? And, but what is the, uh, maybe I will repeat a little bit, but probably it, it, what I would say may sound like, uh, into your matrix, right? Because I see what you've done, like as a matrix, yeah, with, where you can just um, remove and, and put the things. And like, if you had some more parameters in the beginning rather than just 500 hectares, which to me sounds like a big number, like why 500 hectares? Why, why isn't different? Uh, what is the value of the land? I mean, what is the land use of this land? Um, I think it's uh, more important rather than the size, and then it leads to the aesthetics, to the use, and to the attitude, yeah, and, and, and just the general, you know, understanding and uh, bringing this topic up to to the to the public discussions, right? And the next thing which I'm really missing is the influence of the climate change on the peatland, because uh, in the end you had a global map, and I know that your like you're focused in Scotland, but still I think it's super interesting to understand how this matter changes because of the change of the temperature, yeah, and how it may change as forecasted within the change of the temperature. And I mean, because these things are very vulnerable and um, 
And, and when you show the global map, you had like a huge uh, strip yeah, of Russia. But uh, I do know that, you, that the GIS data about this country is nonsense. I mean, because they, <laughs> yeah. it's like in Northern Korea, right? I mean, you, you cannot get the data. But still, the, the fact that the peatland is excessively uh, increasing there day by day because the frost is going away and what we get under is the pitland. So I think the in just in, in general, you know, ecosystem this this question is like one of the main and the most interesting that probably the scientists would get into quite soon. Yeah. And and this is one of the things that I feel a bit contradictory when we as architects and urban planners and even landscape architects are sort of um, try to seem to get the scientific approach completely, like whether we know what types of soil are there, and like when we look into the microscope and we're trying to understand the real reason of what we need to do as a project there. And um, I wish really you to, to, you know, to use this approach and in the future life can only like this, we can get to the truth, yeah, like if, if any exists, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, I'm completely lay person on this, but I was very impressed with your scientific, I mean, I find it really, your analysis and so on, I like that you brought the stuff along, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And obviously the landscape is stunning. I, I've never been there, but I think it might be a good idea to have a little look at it. So the, the closest to this sort of experience for me is when I was in, in, in Poland in Mazurian lakes, where they have quicksand, because I think this is also the unstable soil. And, and what was interesting, and I think that's something one could bring into it, is a sort of narrative, because the Poles, they are living in, in this kind of, you know, heavy stories about uh, ghosts and so on. So we were sort of walking through this stuff and said, well, if you, if you walk in the wrong place, you know, and these are, you know, the kind of stories of child, child, uh, fairy tales, but, but uh, with, with, with the darkness and everything. And I think, because what I found, he said, okay, it's land management, fine. But is that, for me, that's a means to an end and so on. And I think it would be interesting to say, well, what for, in a way? Uh, okay, to, to establish land tax, I think that's a side issue and maybe that won't ever work because the guys will defend themselves. But anyway, but I think what would be more interesting, and you had elements of that for me when you showed, for example, in the end, the past, so, so people could actually experience this very very special place, and so that might be have a sort of a socio-economic or cultural value rather than just the value of the land and taking peat blocks out of it, which obviously we shouldn't do anymore. And so I, th I would have thought that, and also how it relates for me, because I'm someone who likes links, uh, you know, this this part of land, which peatland, to the rest of Scotland, including the urban one, you know, I mean, who would be the visitors there? Uh, is it really people want to have a complete new experience of something they have, like for me, you know, would be, it's, um, or is it something you want they bring back, how they are more aware about, about the impact of climate change, whatever, I mean, there are all sorts of objectives, which I think you could clarify a bit more, saying, you know, this is our needs to achieve, achieve to go there, there, and there, and I think that would be actually very valuable also for, for selling your project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've, I've, I've praised your work in the past, and it's nice to see that you've driven it even further, and I think you should be really proud of the project that you've done, and I think there'll always be a bit of your heart in the Scottish peatlands because it seems like you've really connected with the environment on an, on an emotional level, and I think the last time I was here, I encouraged you to think about these landscapes as, 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 more, as more peopled and as more historically um, uh, and aesthetically charged. And I think you've done that a little bit in the, in, in, in the beginning. I appreciate that's not what you're here to present about, but I acknowledge that you've done that, which is nice. But taking that forward and linking to some of the comments from the, from the, from the previous uh, members of the panel, I think what you actually have here is uh, a tool uh, for engaging with the landscape, which you've established in a very practical way, which is A, uh, transferable, I think, to other uh, sort of bi uh, environments, and uh, 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 woodland, whatever, chalk meadow. Everywhere in theory, we need to be analyzing and producing data about, because we uh, have treated the landscape in a way uh, with, with, and this links to the first, uh, uh, presentation as well, because the, the sort of 
counter side to disposability is, a, is, a, is an ignorance, is a willful ignorance. And we will have to learn about these environments in order to manage them better. Um, and obviously there are people who know about these environments deeply and, 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 and in an embodied way, but not, not all of us do. Um, and you've created a tool and a way of engaging with that, which I think you need to s s yeah, maybe sell or promote more uh, s specifically in terms of the applications of what this can have. You maybe have created, in, in, in theory, a, a, a speculative tax proposal, which I think you do really well, that you, you managed to make a tax proposal quite clear and also on an aesthetically appealing slide, which is a, which is a great achievement. Um, but also what you've potentially created is a, a transferable way of doing things that could be uh, apply to different landscapes, which I think you need to advocate for because they're, they're probably the default thing that will happen and, and what we're seeing with agricultural land management programs is we will default to using purely GIS approaches to analyze in the same abstract way that we're talking about these landscapes at a distance. And that's going to be a very blunt tool, but it's also going to be a very blunt tool that doesn't do some of the things that you've been perhaps criticized for overlooking, e.g. creating connection and leading to different ways of doing things in an embodied fashion um, that you have done a lot of the legwork for. I see it as a potentially as, a, as an educational toolkit predominantly. It would take a lot to turn this into a genuine tax proposal, but I think you've done all the work for a three-day undergraduate geography field trip already, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, I think abstract it a little bit and, 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 and link it in that way to a broader way of engaging communities with their land because we will have to develop knowledge about it and also sort of highlight, yeah, the educational potential of some of these, some of these ways of looking at things as well. Um, not just for the people who are doing the tax proposal, but also for, for other community groups in urban environment as well. I think that's all there already. Um, what else have I got down here? Uh, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, but the one thing you do need to talk about, because you are taking it quite seriously as a proposal, is the fact that if you need to, this would have to be auditable and enforceable, because you can't really trust people to deal with their own taxation. So you need to at least connect the, and acknowledge that connection, because um, I think you talk about expert involvements in, in, the, in the platform, but you need to acknowledge that there's going to be some kind of robust uh, enforcement mechanism, because you are trying to take people's money away from them at the end of the day, for good reasons. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really good. I really hope that you continue to think about this and, and work with this because I think you've done so much great work um, and there's so much to be done for, for, for these environments. Thank you. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Continuing with what Rob was saying about engaging with the um, agricultural world through the GIS platforms, I think... Um, We've discussed this previously, but I think you were a bit shy in criticizing all of these carbon platforms that are going to facilitate the the, the economics of large landowners like uh, in the future. And you can see that there are a lot of them in the making and that your project instead like builds um, literacy around pitlands and knowledge. In the so I think in that way you can also connect about the issues that Rob was saying also related to forests, like we should stop talking about carbon sinks like, and then like uh, explore more of the avenues that you have um, open through your project. I think it's quite interesting that at the end of the project it is criticized because of the idea of the land tax which was the departure point, <laughs> but then that departure point led you into uh, this amazing manual and this uh, democratization of knowledge and data, which is very important because also part of this platform's work is actually collecting a lot of data that is obscurely um, hidden behind uh, the way um, that data is managed. So I think all that transparency and democracy and literacy that you started building through this project, I think could be a very interesting model to scale it up through the um, questions that Rob and the, and the, and the, and the other juries were, were mentioning. And I would also like to mention from the um, from the Oxford Real Farming Conference, there was this from Jutta Kill, one of the interventions in the first day. She was saying about how like carbon calculations convert unique places to generic abstract calculations. And I think that for me like was like the definition of your project, no? Like how to unveil the work that those calculations are doing by really appreciating the unique places beyond the abstract carbon calculations. So yeah, congratulations, particularly on your engagement. It's been amazing this year. Thank you. I have one more point. I don't yeah. mean to end on the sound. 
so I'm just going to be be more clear what you mean when you talk about net zero. Okay. And real zero. I think you can just have one slide with a little table which defines each one because yeah, that, there's lots of different ways of reaching net zero and real zero might not be a sort of concept that people know what it means. Yeah. But Thank you. yeah, otherwise really good. That's it, that wasn't just that. Oh, it's a sour by my standards. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I guess if there's no more comments, uh, well, thank you very much to the, to the students for uh, the, yeah, the wonderful presentations today, you know, the, all the effort they put and, uh, and the results of the, a year of uh, uh, research. Um, yeah, I think uh, at least for the jury or for the guests that are here, I hope you have a, a better idea of what uh, landscape urbanism is uh, trying to, to achieve, no? I mean, you've seen today a number of different practices, no? That, uh, I mean, they see themselves as alternatives, not to, to current forms of practices, not from the construction to uh, <clears throat> uh, analysis of landscapes and how they can be uh, uh, de-abstracted, let's say, to food sovereignty. I know that the term it might be a bit contentious for some people, but I think it's still something that to, to look after, to define, to, uh, to kind of uh, defend, let's say, and to, which is not food nationalism, let's say, but anyway, there's a number of different practices no, that I think are alternatives to the current ones, no? And a number of things that, uh, you know, designers can actually help no, to uh, visualize, to make more visible, no? Uh, there's a lot of uh, work being done to abstract, uh, you know, the landscape, the people, the labor that is uh, embodied on these things, and I think, uh, by visiting those sites, by producing representations, by uh, you know showing that uh, in the way you've shown, I think is a kind of a, a, a tremendous uh, addition, let's say, to to the to the profession. No? So uh, I think this this is something that we are uh, trying to develop in the program, and we we'll hopefully be developing in the next year. No, uh, I mentioned that you know some of these policies are part of the Green New Deal. Uh, uh, we're trying to make them as special as possible. Well, we're trying to make them to take the information that some other disciplines are producing that may be perhaps too technical, but I think uh, this conjunction between aesthetics, for example, and uh, technicality or what might be seen as more scientific approach is what we can bring to the table, no? literally. And, and, and it's something that uh, I guess, uh, at least in landscape urbanism, we are endeavor to to do that. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, and yeah, thank you uh, for the whole year. <laughs>